Oh, I believe we need to have our uh, Pledge of Allegiance. Dr. Severe, would you mind leading us? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, uh, first up we have governance, uh, our consent agenda. Is there anything, are there any amendments to the consent agenda as listed? I'd like to um, remove 1B6 off the consent agenda. All right, that's Millsaps, Gal, and Government Relations, all right. Any other amendments? I'd like to remove um, 1B7, please. All right, Nashville Teacher Residency. Any other amendments to the consent agenda as listed? Do I have a motion to accept? Move a set, uh, I move that we accept the consent agenda with the said uh, deletions. All right, that was Dr. Gentry with the motion. I have a second? Second. Uh, this is Poopa Walker. Any discussion? All right. All in favor of, of accepting the consent agenda as amended, raise your hand. All right, unanimous. All right, so we'll start with uh, consent agenda 1B6, Millsaps, Gowan, and Government Relations. Mrs. Player Peters. Uh, yes, so uh, during the last meeting, or the meeting before last, sorry, I can't remember. Um, during the advocacy committee, I expressed um, this my issues with communication and I want to thank uh, Dr. Severe and Mr. North for help um, flowing, continuing that with uh, Millsap, Gowan, um, Relations help getting the information to us. Um, so I wanted to just thank them for that. But I think there also needs to be a bigger discussion about as clients, but then also as our role, there's been a shift uh, with the I guess, coalitions that we've been a part of with CUBE, NSBA, TSBA, the shift that's going on. But, kind of have a conversation of what do we need as clients with, um, with government relations, given how special session went, um, that we have clear expectations of um, with class, with Millsack Gallon, um, and then with each other. Because you know one thing is so being in this profession, making sure we're all singing from the same page as we advocate collectively between the four districts, advocate for ourselves, that we're not doing um, because the worst thing you could do sometimes as lobby is that you don't know what your client's doing or you don't know what your lobbyists are doing. So somehow we can just smooth that communication, but also as a client, what's, what do we need? We're in a different situation. You know, um, the executive branch of the state has put, particularly focused on us in Shelby County and how do we engage and have this conversation around that focus that we have? How do we advocate for a district? What does that look like? How do you advocate amongst the other school board members? And particularly since there's a shift between especially large school districts across the country, what do we need? What does that look like? And make sure we're setting the proper expectations and proper communication channels as us as a board, um, as a client, and then also with, um, um, with class. Um, and so I just wanna have that discussion to make sure we're all going on the same page going into session. Um, so I, I've been attending the class information. We've been getting regular updates on the bills that are coming up. Um, which is good because I know during special session, I know I was reached out by the media, I was reached out to some other people and trying to figure out what are, what's our talking points? What are we saying? Because I came from a cautious standpoint, our counterpart in Shelby County came more of a forward-facing message. And so as we do that, like what, how do we communicate just as class? So I know Ms. Walker is a class representative and it's like for her, if possible, um, to have that conversation. So make sure we're on board just because the way the conversation is happening now, particularly within the pandemic, but then also the support facing of the changes of education with the voucher bill, with the BEP funding, with you know going, going on with our lawsuit. What does that look like now? Because I think the approach as we ask our, um, our services to do needs to be on the same page as all four districts. And particularly since Shelby County and Davidson County are lumped together differently from Knox and from Hamilton, that what does that conversation looks like? And so I just thought this would be a good time to just kind of have a little bit of a conversation around um, that um, as, as we ask them to go into the services and as we you know, reimburse them um, with the fiscal agent of Shelby County, that we kind of just work all together on the same page. So does the fiscal agent um, alternate? Is that how it works with the four different districts? 
in class. Yes. Yep. It does. I'm, I'm Dr. Gentry? To, oh. I'm happy to. Go ahead. Uh, I don't know if this is a, maybe a something for an advocacy committee conversation, um, what the next best step is. I'm happy to think that through with you, Ms. Masters. Yeah, I would be happy to have that conversation just to sort of clarify. I know that at our um, at our retreat, it came out that we all um, wanted to be invited to the fr the class calls and then wanted to receive the written information afterwards, sort of summarizing it. And that wasn't something that was just automatically happen happening. Um, and so I think maybe by diving just a little bit deeper on what all of us as board members would like to be receiving from this relationship, we could increase the clarity with them about what we need, how timely it needs to be, even in the area of guidance about, you know, how we can be communicating with legislators um, and trying to get ahead of things like a legislative special session that's completely focused on education um, where the bills don't come out until, you know, right before they're being discussed. Uh, to, oh, Dr. Uh, that's okay. Yes, yeah, so, so I, I don't know if you mentioned this, um, Ms. Player Peters, but you know we're also getting pulled out of our relationship with NSBA, right? So all of these same four school districts are going to be prohibited from being members of NSBA because TSBA will not, no longer be a member and we cannot join as a board. Um, so I just, uh, my concern is that our avenues for advocacy and awareness of legislative impact um, need to be spot on, they need to be tight, uh, and they need to be singularly focused on um, what it means and the impact on urban school districts. And we're losing uh, a big piece of that with the disconnect from NSBA. And so I don't know, and I think we're, I know we're in session now, maybe there's a time to a point that we just collectively as a part of governance and or advocacy, just take a look at what this agreement is bringing to the table. Um, and if there's something else we need, uh, if, if if we believe just adhering to those, um, those uh, whatever the, the, the offerings are as currently stated is enough, then so be it. But I think we need to review it with the lens in mind that it is almost our single source uh, if we're not intentional as, individ as a board in, in, in staying on top of some of these things. Would it, would it be beneficial then to perhaps to convene, just have a rep delegate from each of the districts that are sort of the pivot, like I am, the main point of contact with class, the class, what rep am I trying to say here? The, the delegates from each grade. district, maybe we need to just have a quick circle up. Yeah, just to hear if they Think have similar great. questions and yeah, okay. And I just want to clarify that I have found the information that class is offering um, incredibly helpful because otherwise I think I, I would have been without that information combined with with our own staff member, Mark North, um, it, it got a little bit crazy there for a little while. So I was um, grateful for that information. But I'd, yeah, I'd like to go deeper with it and get more out of the relationship if possible. All right, so with next steps, oh, were there, are there, no, go right ahead. Oh, I was going to move for approval, but. Oh, that's what I was going to say. Are there any other next steps we need to make before we approve, or will we just follow up? Um, I think we just need to have Ms. Walker just convene with the other districts and just say, like, what do we need now, just given where we are in the state? Um, do we need to have that conversation with class as we go into the next session? Because um, it well, starts today. Um, they didn't start last week because of the weather. And then making sure they're just, we're all on board and we're just collectively, so there's just not confusion with that. And then I think after the session, we have a bigger conversation of what do we need given that TSBA is moving out of NSBA and what does that look like and making sure we're just getting the most out of our contract uh, with class and with other organizations that does advocacy. Okay. All right, if you feel good with that, yep. thank you. Great. Thank you all for this. All right, well, we have a motion to accept or to approve. Do I have a second? A second. All right, that was Mr. Little on second. Uh, all in favor, raise your hand. All right, unanimous. Uh, we'll move on to, or, so Millsaps Gallon Government Relations has passed. We'll move on to 1B7, Nashville Teacher Residency. 
That's me. Miss Masters. So so I appreciate that the the first agenda that came out, which I think I maybe have pulled up an old one, um, had no dollar amount attached to this, but the most recent one. Oh, you got the most recent one. Um, but I'm, I just want to get some clarification around the purchase exception report, um, the fact that the services have already been provided with no contract and we're now being asked to approve it retroactively. So just what, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> no problem, good question. Um, I'm gonna ask um, Dr. Barnes, our chief of HR, to uh, come up and address the National Teacher Reg Residency contract. Good evening, board. Um, the National Teacher Residency is a, is a recruitment tool which allows teachers to come in for a year as an instructional aide while they complete their uh, teaching requirements with the university. At the end of that first year, we have the opportunity to hire them as teachers and then following a year of their, uh, excuse me, a semester of their employment as a teacher, the bill then comes due for the National Teacher Residency. So the people that are on this, uh, this payment here actually started with us a year and a half ago. Um, during the previous administration, I wasn't aware that there hadn't been an RFP done until we got this bill now. So what we've done is I've looked forward. Um, we currently have a number of national teacher residents now who, if we hire them at the close of this school year, we will receive a bill a year from now. And we've started the RFP process and done the spoke, scope of work to ensure that it doesn't happen again. That's great. I mean, that's really, it's not a question about oh, no. this process of bringing in teachers or, I mean, the, let's get more teachers. But um, no, just, yeah, really about the process and understanding why, why we were being asked to vote on something um, that wasn't contracted. So it sounds like since we're going to have an RFP process moving forward that that's been taken care of. And I've also looked at all the other things that HR pays for to see if there's anything else that has gotten lost in the shuffle. Right. I appreciate that. I do want to also state that we do have the opportunity to choose to hire these folks at the end of their first year. So being a part of the program, we still get to vet them and, and, and determine that, that, you know, we get the opportunity to see them for a whole year. But uh, we do have the option at the end of that to hire them or not. So we only pay for the ones that we do hire. So when, uh, I'm sorry, when, um, you know, in looking for these types of programs, when we put out an RFP that, I mean, in theory, this vendor might not, we might not choose this vendor in the in the future. We might choose some other vendor that can provide this type of service. Is it an open RFP? But Jeff Gossage, I'm referring uh, to who's Jeff. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that is correct. When we do an RFP, it is an open competitive process. You're looking at past performance. That is one of the issues you're looking at. Uh, I think with this contract, we have in the past looked at multiple awardees, so it's possible that we could even have more than one contract result from the RFP. Okay. And we currently have two teacher residency programs. We have the National Teacher Residency and, and MNUTR as well. And so there are several universities who would appreciate the opportunity to work with us in this kind of fashion too. And, and, our, and I'm assuming we are tracking sort of the, I'm sorry, don't sit oh, down. I don't know um, why I left. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm assuming we are tracking sort of the, the effectiveness of the program and you know, the retention of the teachers that Correct. come through that program. Because, okay, or great. That we are moving forward. Totally rhetorical question. I knew, I knew the answer. <laughs> I know. going to be my question about <laughs> the retention of the teachers and making sure that it's a long-term solution instead of a short-term high turnover. Correct. So that's Correct. important to me that we get people in place, especially in high-need schools, that are going to be solid and are going to stay. Correct. Can I, can I add something here? So the State Board of Education uh, produces every year a scorecard on every teacher preparation program in the state, including residency programs. Any Teach for America universities and they rate them on a whole range of indicators. And NTR always ranks very highly on a whole range of metrics, including uh, high rating on the number that stay in the profession, uh, as well as diversity, one of the most diverse teacher prep programs in the state, and also the teachers that then become go into the classroom have very high performance on TVOS and growth. So, you know, I think they have proven themselves over time. They're small, but I think they're you know, they're focused on quality. So, but I totally get it. We want to make sure we're getting the best bang for our buck. No. There is benefit to, to growing up in the environment where you want them to be in. Mm -hmm. So a whole year of work with the school 
helps embed you in the culture of that school, the work that they do, and that usually helps with the, with the turnover rate as well. And many and of them just stay remind. serving in the schools where they are residents. So that's, an, that's also a positive of the program. And this is just kind of from my knowledge, is it treated like a student-teacher relationship? Yeah, they're paid as an instructional aide, which is sort of a, a, a little step below a paraprofessional. Mm -hmm. So it, it, they work with a co-teacher while they're doing their work. Okay, and then do they have a teaching license? They will at the end of it. Okay, thank you. And we also have programs that help them with the praxis and things like that so that mm -hmm. they, they can achieve their license. All right, any other questions, thoughts? All right, do we have a motion? I'll move that we approve the... Wait, no, we... Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now sit down. The contract with National Teacher Residency. All right. Uh, a second. A second. Second. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> all right. All in favor, raise your hand. All right. Unanimous. All right. We'll move on to under governance issues. Um, bullet two, a proclamation recognizing the importance of arts education. Mrs. Masters? Oh, oh, I don't have it up. Hang on. Sorry. Y'all for that again. <laughs> so, um, so I, I just want to preface this by saying that um, the arts have been um, a, a huge influence in my life and um, in, in many different arenas. And I had the opportunity as a public school student in Tennessee to participate in a wide variety of arts programs. And so I'm very happy that we as a board are choosing to recognize that importance collectively. I think we hear a lot about athletics, which is also amazing and wonderful. Um, we hear a lot about um, vocational education, which is amazing and wonderful. Um, but I want to point out that we have some amazing arts programs here in our schools. Um, and we have National School of the Arts, which I genuinely believe is contributing to um, children graduating from high school because they might not otherwise be, I'm, I'm not going to cry, and they might not otherwise be as motivated to continue with their education. So it's very important, and I appreciate being asked to be the one to read this. A proclamation recognizing the importance of arts education. Whereas all students have the right to an arts education that includes dance, media arts, music, theater, and visual arts taught by certified arts educators in partnership with community providers. And whereas arts education has the power to change students' lives. And whereas Arts education is a key to reigniting students' learning in a post-COVID-19 world. And whereas, arts education helps nurture healthy, inclusive communities where all points of view are respected. And whereas, arts education experiences help students understand their own cultural roots and appreciate others' cultural roots and traditions. And whereas, arts education supports the social and emotional well-being of students and fosters a more positive, safer school environment. Whereas, arts education is part of the well-rounded education for every student, as outlined in the Every Student Succeeds Act and in state law. Therefore, be it proclaimed that we, the Metropolitan National Board of Education, recognize the importance of arts education and pledge to our intent to maintain and grow our arts education programs in the 2021-22 school year and beyond. Do we have a motion to, no, we don't have to vote on this proclamation, we do. Okay, yeah. We don't. We have a motion. We do need a motion. A resolution? Oh, it's a, proclamation. a proclamation. Proclamation. Yeah. What are we voting? What is what is that? Voting to adopt. The resolution. Okay, well I move it's to not adopt. A resolution. It's a proclamation. It's a proclamation. You have the option to take a, uh, action on anything that comes before you as an as a potential action item. All right, let's just because yeah. I think we agree. I so, move okay. to um, adopt the proclamation. 
I second. Any discussion? Here, here. All right, all in favor, raise your hand. <laughs> I like all right, that. and that passes unanimously because we are arts lovers. <laughs> All right, we'll move on to reports, and we have one from um, Dr. Battle. Uh, if you'll notice, there, this, this language that we are trying to have, this a shared language that we're looking to develop around our core tenants, our signature initiatives, and our focused outcomes. With that in mind, Dr. Battle, thank you for preparing this. Please take it away. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, board members. It's good, be, good to be with you again, and I've enjoyed seeing several of you during some of the virtual events I've done over the last few days. I was really happy to hear the support for our schools coming from Metro Council members and community members when I spoke with Vice Mayor Shulman for one of his community conversations Saturday morning. Thank you to everyone who was able to attend. That was great to hear as we head into budget season, and I know we will all continue to advocate for the district's needs so we can better serve our students and our staff. Today was another milestone day in our reopening plan as fifth and ninth graders entered our middle and high schools for the first time. And as I visited two of our middle schools, Head and McKissick, I could see that we made the right decision to bring those new students before the older ones. They'll have a chance to learn where everything is and move through the halls at their own pace for a few days before the sixth through eighth graders and 10th through 12th graders come back. It was a thrill to see students, principals, teachers, and staff coming into their buildings, following protocols, going into their classrooms, and picking up in person where they had left off virtually last week. And we expect to see more and more scenes like that over the next week or so. Next slide, please. I'm pleased to be able to say that our COVID risk score has dropped all the way down to 4.1, an indication that our community continues to do a good job of reducing the spread of the virus. Although we do know that additional progress can be attributed to our community assessment centers being closed last week. When we met two weeks ago, the risk score was 5.7, which was already well below our threshold. And that's not the only good news as far as fighting the pandemic is concerned. On Saturday, Vanderbilt Health started vaccinating our educators, our staff, at 100 Oaks. I was happy to get my own left arm poke to help set an example and show that there is nothing to be afraid of. The process was smooth. The Vanderbilt Health staff was great, and our teachers and staff left with smiles on their faces and relief on their minds after a very long year. For anyone who hasn't scheduled an appointment yet, I strongly encourage you to do so. Speaking of our teachers and staff, this is the first time we've met since we announced our support employees, teachers, and principal of the year. I've spoken to them in our virtual events, but I want to say again how proud I am of them for their incredible work ethic, dedication, skill, and care for our students and families that they show day after day. Congratulations and thank you to Mr. Lee, Ms. Lyman, Ms. Finney, Mr. Farmer, Ms. Hicks, Ms. Kesey, Ms. Gansky, and Dr. Stewart for everything you do. You are leading the way amongst other great leaders all across our district. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chief of Human Resources, Chris Barnes again. He's gonna provide us an update um, regarding where we are with our core tenant, equipping and empowering our leaders at all levels. Dr. Bond, Barnes, over to you. Evening again, board. It's a, it's a Barnes kind of evening, I guess, for you. Um, <laughs> we're so proud of what the MMPS HR department has done over the last year, and I really appreciate the opportunity to spend some time and share that with you folks. As you know, to start with, uh, the school board, Dr. Battle, and district leadership, you guys have done a great job of creating a comprehensive roadmap for success for everyone. Uh, back when I came to school from an uh, alternate pathway, I worked in a wilderness program, and we used to talk about destination is found if you have direction and determination. And it's so great to find real clear direction and work for us to move forward through the core tenets, through our focused outcomes, and through our North Star. I think as you can see, oh, sorry, when you look at the core tenants, you can see that human capital and human resources is embedded in all four of these areas. And I'm gonna break that down for you in a little bit and show you a little more of what I mean with that. I've listed for you the seven budget priorities for the upcoming school year, 
And it's our feeling that the work in HR embeds itself in all seven of these areas. I'd like to focus your attention and applaud you for the work you've done in placing employee compensation on the top of your list. Before we go further, we've got to acknowledge there's been a lot of work done in the past year and a half on this as well. We provided a 3% cost of living increase a year ago in January, and since July 1, all MMPS employees received more than $15 an hour. However, there's a lot of research being done around the nation about teacher and employee retention, and we can't ignore the need to address salaries deliberately and comprehensively. To start with, Daniel Pink wrote a book called Drive, and it says there are a lot of really interesting things about employee satisfaction. One of the quotes that jumped out to me was for his to say that the best use of money as a motivator is to hire great people and pay them enough to take the issue of money off the table. And when you do that, obviously we know that salary is a key component in employee satisfaction. But interestingly, the data shows that when salary is not the focus of attention, it turns to some of the things that MMPS is working so hard on already, which are three main components for employee satisfaction, which is a mastery of subject matter, self-direction, and a unity of purpose. And if we can continue to work to get the salary issue resolved, we can focus our attention on those things that really help children. Nationally, salary compensation remains one of the largest factors for teacher turnover. And as the, year go, as the years go by, I'm going to show you how it's becoming harder and harder to attain and retain the best applicants. And so we have to deliberately affect as many of these issues as we can. And salary is, is one of those key components. I want to share with you that currently, Tennessee ranks 37th in the country in teacher salary. And Chris Henson wanted me to make sure I pointed out that it's 46 in per, per pupil spending as well. Um, but the next slide shows some significant challenges we have. This latest report that we have shows funding for MMPS teachers compared to the national average for teacher salaries. You can see that we've done a lot of work in, our, in, in year one in beginning teachers, but after that, each milestone that goes by, you find us falling further behind. So our salaries aren't staying competitive as teachers become more experienced. So now we get to talk again about Hire Forward, and I introduced this to you a year ago, but at its core, Hire Forward looks to the day when we have people waiting for jobs, not jobs waiting for people. And it's a deep abiding relationship with our universities, with our principals, and, our, our, and the idea that it's embedded in the research that there's no single factor for student achievement more important than having a certificated experience teacher in a classroom. And our goal is to reduce the amount of time that our, teacher, that our students go without a teacher in front of them. You've seen this before. Hire Forward has three main buckets to it, obtain, train, and retain. And it's so important we affect all three of these. I'm gonna briefly run through some of the work we've done in each of these areas over the, over the past year. For obtain, I went ahead and, and put the core tenets that we think most directly relate to obtaining the best candidates in our school system. But I want to begin by sharing with you some of the national research that's been done that highlights the concerns about teacher recruitment and hiring. Now, the folks at the Economic Policy Institute <coughs> have done a series of reports called The Perfect Storm in the Teacher Labor Market. And it talks about how what's happening across the nation in the teaching profession affects us in Nashville as well. And for us to be agile and, and aware of what's going on, we need to look at that national research too. <coughs> Excuse me. This report shows that even 10 years ago, what you had was a situation where there were more applicants than there were jobs. But over the last decade, low enrollment in teacher, enrollment in teacher education programs, retirement and, and flight from the profession has flipped that narrative over. And as the years go on and as the years continue to go forward, you see that gap widening. And what's happening with that is we now find ourselves in fierce competition with other districts and other states to find the best candidates for our students. Why does it matter? Obtaining good teachers and teacher shortages permeates every bit of a teacher's life. It works into the day-to-day -day workings of a school. And it's <coughs> cyclical, so high turnover creates more turnover because of the burden it's placing on the teachers in the building. It also relates to resources that we could better spend in other areas because the cost of onboarding new teachers is expensive. 
It also means a lot of times we replace an experienced educator with a new educator. And what you lose in that is that embedded knowledge of that person in the classroom for all that time they've been there. Why it matters to us is if we can't have a, a, a certified, experienced teacher in front of our students, we won't be able to realize our focused outcomes. <coughs> we have a goal to look at literacy, math, social emotional learning, and successful student transitions. And again, when I spoke about research showing that a teacher is the greatest effect score in student achievement, it's three times as large as any other indicator that we can find. <coughs> and if we can't train our staff well enough or we struggle to keep them, it increases the burden of our teachers, which affects our work environment thereby. So let's move on to something I've been waiting to show you for a year. <laughs> what you're seeing here is the vacancy rate in MMPS over the last three years. Now you can see these peaks here, those are happen every June as the traditional turnout of teachers happens. But as you can see over the past nine months or so, we've consistently kept the vacancy rate of our employees very, very low, lower than it's been in years. I don't know if you remember, but 363 days ago, I came in front of you guys to give my first report on HR. And those moments of terror sort of, you know, solidify my mind and remember. <laughs> but a year ago, I showed you the slide on the left. That was our number of teacher vacancies a year ago. On the right is today. Even in hard to staff areas, you'll see a significant decline in vacancy rates. And it's even affected areas like paraprofessionals. And I think we need to recognize the hard work that the HR team and the t principals have done to affect this vacancy rate. The first step to licking this problem permanently is to start the, <coughs> the tradition of this not happening every year. So obviously we've, we've come a, a great long way in a year, but let's look, this one actually is my favorite slide. We currently have 107 schools who don't have teacher vacancies. And we only have four schools that have what I would consider a significant number. So that work has been done systemically across the district. And Sharon wanted me to make sure that I, how many vacancies do we have in SOI? Three? One. I think it's three. But, but traditionally, our hard to staff schools have seen that improvement as well. It hasn't just been in one area. It's been systemically across the board. I don't know if you remember last summer, we sent out an initiative to ask our principals to tweet out when they have the 100% fully vacant, fully, fully vacant, excuse me, 100% <laughs> fully staffed. And as you can see here, I'm proud to report that most of these schools have remained fully staffed throughout the entire school year. And that's, of course, something you're going to see again this summer. <coughs> Obviously, one of our other core tenets is to have an eye on eliminating uh, inequities. I did a, I did a search and, and did some research on how our what our um, diversity looks like across three different groupings, our support employees, our certificated admin, and our, and our uh, teaching staff. As you can see, there's one area which we want to affect significantly. I do want to mention, however, that the latest TDOE report shows a statewide diversity sits at approximately 13% for teachers and 20% for certificated admin. So while we are better, than, the, than, than that, we want to continue our goal to work until our school staff is mirrored by our student demographic. So one of the ways we're going to do that, as you can see here, most of our recruiting and most of our work should be done in the local metro area. Around us, we have a lot of universities. We have a lot of opportunities. Regionally, we're going to go to those fairs as well because they're close enough for us to go to in, in, a, in a way that's cost effective. We really need to focus our national attention on places like HBCUs and HSIs, those that are Hispanic serving institutions and historically black colleges and universities. And if we're gonna go out of our region, we need to be making that money work for us to help us eliminate our inequities in our, in our teaching staff. Moving on to training. We've got a lot of great stuff going on in, in this and I obviously embedded that core tenant as well. One of our signature initiatives is a new leadership framework. And that leadership framework, I want to be clear, is not just for principals, but for all of our district leadership. And it's a great way to help move the whole ball down the field forward, not just for schools, but for our district as well. We worked in coordination with the Nashville Public Education Foundation 
And the new leadership framework really embeds itself in three areas, instruction, operations, and people. It's my favorite part, people, right? So it really works on developing our staff, inspiring a vision, and creating a culture that's healthy at every school in our district. <coughs> Obviously, best practice and research shows that when you have an effective principal in a building, it affects every area of the building. It affects student attendance, it affects your climate, and it affects teacher turnover. We've also been working to develop uh, a comprehensive roadmap for new teachers over the course of their first five years with us so we can embed those critical areas that we want them to learn and help them be successful as teachers. We know that primarily our turnover happens in the first five years. And that's our area to zero in on and help those teachers become as effective as possible. Looking on at retaining, I couldn't really pick one core tenant, so I picked them all. Um, retaining good employees is part of everything that we do. Research shows academically that students perform better in schools with low turnover than with high turnover. And it also shows that if we have a stable workforce, our student outcomes improve and our teachers become more collaborative with each other because they have more opportunity. If you needed another reason than that, there's also a financial impact of turnover. The cost of reteaching, onboarding, retraining staff, and hiring them costs money too. Now, these two different reports I looked very widely on the cost, but it still comes down to millions of dollars that we're using that we could spend other ways if we could work on retaining our workforce more effectively. Now, I want to show you the next slide, which shows our turnover rate. For the first year in five, you've seen a significant decline in turnover in three of the four areas that we looked at. <coughs> our teachers, our support employees, and our other certificated staff, which includes counselors, academic coaches, media coordinators, is the lowest that it's been in five years. The next move is how do we keep this moving forward? I think and that's the next step. I want to reflect again that everything HR does embeds itself in our core tenants and our focused outcomes. That our work in HR is systemic and critical in making these other things a reality. Our leadership framework is part of our signature initiatives. And our future challenges for HR, we want to provide greater supports to our new teachers. We want to improve our ability to hire earlier and hire better. We want to shift ourselves from a reactive to a predictive state, which means, and actually, Mr. Little, you, one of your questions uh, earlier uh, yesterday res responds to this specifically. We need to be planning ahead, not just for August, but for years from August, building programs and plans that will affect this district in years to come. Until we can stop dealing with the day-to-day -day and move forward, that's where we want to go with HR. How can you help as a board? Obviously, communicate about opportunities and advantages to working with MMPS. Funnel questions and concerns to the Department of HR so we can resolve them and, and move forward. And of course, as you're already doing, advocating for the budget priorities for the district. And I will leave you with that. Thank you, Mr. Barnes. Back battle. Chair Bugs. Sure, go ahead. Can I say something? Great. Um, well, first, I just, I, I've got to tell you how excited I was to see all that information about teacher retention, about making sure that our, um, we're, we're filling our vacancies. It's so important. So first of all, just congratulations. Keep doing it. <laughs> um, and then secondly, I just I have a couple of things I wanted to say. First, you gave some stats about how we are compared um, to, this, to the rest of the country as far as how we fund our pupils and how we fund our teachers. And I wanted to just add one more to that, that in Tennessee, if you look just in Tennessee alone, teachers make 21.4% less than other comparable college educated workers. Um, so when you're comparing college educated workers in Tennessee, teachers make 21.4% less than the same level. Um, and right now, Senator Heidi Campbell has brought a bill before the Tennessee Senate that will provide a $500 hazard pay bonus for every part-time school district employee and a $1,000 bonus for every full-time employee. And this is for the state. Um, so I just wanted to encourage everybody listening and, and those of us on the board to contact your state senator and ask them to pass this. It is 
Bill SB 1358. So I, that I think is important for us to recognize that. And then to kind of piggyback off of that, I really wanted to ask Dr. Battle, have we considered using some of our SR 2.0 funds to provide a one-time bonus for our staff? Um, yes, we have. We will um, soon be sharing with the board um, the final requests that have gone in with our ESSER application. Right. Um, so yes, we have. And we're also looking at ways to leverage um, our increase in our BEP, um, instructional component of our BEP um, to help supplement. That Wonderful. Effort. Thank you. So that's, that's a really good point you brought up because turnover happens in two areas, people who leave the profession and people who move around within the profession. And yes. it really breaks about 8% a piece. So we have to affect that 8% who leave us to teach somewhere else. And also, how can we address the 8% who leave the profession entirely? So I think that's a great point. So Yeah, I can't tell you how many people I know that I've personally been friends with who have left teaching for a higher paying job, not because they didn't want to teach and not because they didn't love the kids, but because they could not survive without more than one job. And so they, they did. Um, so yeah, I just, that's really important. I was really excited to hear about it and, and just that advocacy is important to me. Um, and then I, I had a question, you shared us pictures about the vaccines, Dr. Battle, and I was so excited. Um, I'm not gonna lie, I teared up a little bit when I first saw the pictures of teachers receiving vaccines. It just, the idea that we're providing protection to them in, in a meaningful way that proves that we care about them and that we want their safety to be at the forefront, to me just, it, it touches something deep inside. So I, I was very pleased to see those. Um, and educators, please keep sharing those pictures. They're very, very exciting. Um, and I just wanted to ask, do we have a plan to support teachers that choose to receive their shots that, that can only get an appointment during the school day? Um, um, are they gonna be allowed to, to you know, leave without having to take a sick day or having, and especially after that second shot, my husband is a, um, a hospital employee and he's had his second shot and oh boy, it is, a, it is really a rough acclimation. So um, I just wanted to ask about what our plan was to support our teachers as they receive their shots. Yeah, so um, first thing, um, we've had already close to 5,700 um, of our staff members who have made appointments and started to be vaccinated, which that is something to um, celebrate. That's not including uh, many of our staff members, employees who we know have traveled um, to already um, get the vaccine. So again, we're encouraging everyone, respond to your email, set up your appointment, go in. It's a pretty efficient process that has been um, established. We proactively worked um, closely uh, with Vanderbilt on scheduling times for our employees that would be um, flexible and really meet um, their schedules. And so, as we mentioned before, um, seven days a week, um, early hours, late hours for our staff to be there. But we've also encouraged our school principals and school leadership teams um, to work closely with their school staff um, in getting their first and second dose of the vaccine. So, of course, we encourage, you know, if you can, weekends before, after school, if you can, if you can't, um, we've encouraged our teams to work closely with everyone to be accommodating because we want all of our employees who are interested in getting vaccinated to do so. And so your, the guidance has been not to penalize them by making them take a day um, out of their own sick leave or their own personal leave. I just so really the, want to make sure that so they're the, not penalizing them for doing something that's going to keep them safe. So the guidance for our employees is to work with their school leadership team mm -hmm. on making arrangements if they need to go during the school day um, for the vaccine. Wonderful. Thank you. Question for you. Yes, ma'am. I want you to help me along because I may miss talk about just um, what I, someone brought to my attention. So tell me about the student teachers that we had that had to go elsewhere. Um, I think at the last minute they were told, I think these teachers are interns, they come from different universities um, that will shadow our teachers and hopefully, because I know we talked about this national teacher residency. Mm -hmm. So tell me, and you, can, you, may, you may have to just kind of help me through, what, so what happened? So was it that there were student teachers and they had to go to different, they were told at the last minute because of COVID um, that they had to go and do their internships other places like different counties or something like that. Are you aware of that? I'm not aware of that. We have student teachers in the district right now and we actually have worked to get them schoology access so they can interact with their kids. I'm not aware of any that were told to go somewhere else. Do you know of a specific university or group? Yeah, so what else? Yeah, it was, it was talked about, you know, a lot, you know, on social media about how these students had to, um, you know, scramble to find elsewhere to go um, to 
different counties do their student teaching or something like that. But I can get more information for you from uh, for you because I want I wanted some clarification around that. I know that it was talked about. I just didn't know, you know, what was what was uh, happening. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to know yeah. more. I'll do my own research too. I know okay. that we're actually starting to go out and visit with student teachers now to talk with them about you know staying in MMPS afterwards. So I know that we have a, a good right number now. But I'll find out if there's anything that. One university or a specific group is, is that a, is that a process that we take? You know, as far as these universities that are student teachers that go into, of course, teaching, and then they transition into shadowing our teachers, and then eventually become a part of M MNPS if they, you know, go through the process and that kind of thing. Is that some? Is that a process we're taking? Mm -hmm. Even to the extent last year, I was actually got in front of all of the seniors who were in uh, the education class and got to go talk with them about MNPS. So there's a process of working them through that. We even, um, uh, want to, I don't remember the name of the university, I'm sorry, but 30 of their student teachers actually signed up to become subs uh, during this time as well. So I'll research that and, and I'll, I'll certainly get back to you if I find out anything. Okay, thank uh, you. And I'll echo, please share that information um, with us because we've um, worked very diligently to get access to our student teachers. Um, these are individuals who are training in our classrooms and that we want to keep here in MNPS. So if there's any specific individual scenario, we would love to know because we've tried to retain everyone right. um, yeah. during this time. Yeah. And that's why I was making mention of it because I knew that that was something that we, and congratulations to a good job of, of you know, making sure that we are looking so much better as far as retention. So congratulations to that, you. That's the HR team that did that. I just, uh, I just stand around looking pretty. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Player Peters. Uh, yes. Um, Back to your diversity slide, mm -hmm. how do you define diversity? When you say 50% diversity, 54% diversity, 29% diversity, yeah. how, how are we as HR defining diversity to make sure we're all seeing from the same page? I, I use uh, white for the majority and then everything that was not either two or more races, Hispanic, black as diversity. Okay. And are, are we also keeping track of gender also with the diversity also? I did. I didn't prepare that slide. Okay. Um, but I do have that transition by, by group as well, by gender. Mrs. Masters? I just, I was thinking about all that, all that's being done here in MMPS to help us re recruit and retain teachers. And um, would it be helpful to you if our um, city um, government were to work diligently toward providing incentive programs, housing vouchers, focused transportation resources for teachers? Would that be something that would be helpful to MMPS if we could forge that kind of citywide initiative? <laughs> I think our primary attention needs to be devoted to those brand new teachers who are just coming into the profession. If you were to ask me as, as, as the HR chief, where, where do I need to focus my attention most? It's retaining those newest educators. And when they come out of school, they're just over inundated with information. And anything we do to, to help stem that tide would be wonderful. So yes, leave in the we, first five we would years. we would embrace <laughs> yes. any and all of those yes. sports. <laughs> well, and speak, you know, talking about national level recruiting, um, that you know, I feel, I mean, Nashville's an it city, y'all, right? So it seems like Sharon's smirking in the <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> we have a reputation oh, as an it relative, city. It's all relative, Emily. It's all relative. Depends on who you ask. In spite of, you know, some of these numbers that we see. And so, uh, yeah, um, yeah, I just. Well, and, and that is, Nashville is a destination, right? So it, right. there is, you know, at my age, all I want is a peace and quiet and a good night's sleep. But, <laughs> you know, people graduating college want a nightlife and want excitement and things to do. And, and Nashville certainly has that in spades. So the, uh, you know, a citywide initiative to offer affordable housing to teachers could potentially be something useful and something that the advocacy committee could consider as something to talk with our leaders about. Well, you know, based on that book study, we got to use those committee structures effectively. So I appreciate the thought. Right. That's right. Ms. Bucco Walker. But Mr. Barnes research, you know, shows that in the last recession, teachers stayed because there were no other jobs or people didn't retire and so forth. I'm sure that's happening here as well. It's happening across the country where people are deferring retirement or staying in the profession. So, how, so I think you're totally right to emphasize when the economy picks back up, assuming it does, that we can keep all of these folks. 
Um, and so anything we can do to help with that, I think all of these incentive ideas are fabulous. And so Nashville is an expensive place to live. And so how do we keep our teachers uh, from our first our new teachers to our most seasoned teachers, right? How do we keep them in the profession? What would that take? So we're all ears on how to make that happen. And not to bring it back to the core tenants, but the way we treat people matters. Yep. And I think that's what's so powerful about what we're doing is because it's clear and it's focused on the schools and the teachers and the staff in the schools, so. Um, do we have partnerships that are specific to our colleges with for student teachers mm -hmm. that come to us that are, mm -hmm. And then do those programs also include um, like not really internships, but opportunities to volunteer beforehand for those same students before they student teach? They do encourage that. And, and most school programs, the amount of time you spend in a school levels up as you go towards student yes. teaching. Mm -hmm. But uh, we have opportunities. I've talked to them about bus driving. I've talked to them about uh, you know coming in and subbing because some of their schedules would provide for that. And typically, those programs require practicum, observations, volunteer um, hours, and we definitely um, support um, our local universities in those efforts. Yeah, I, I know that it, this, the teacher prep programs that wait to put their students in a right. classroom until their student teaching don't tend to have the best results. Correct. So I think just as frequently as we can get kids that want, or I say kids, like I'm saying, <laughs> yeah, that if it's, as frequently as we can get future teachers in the classroom to get them acclimated right. to this is what it's really like. This is how you can you know, cope with what's going on and be successful. Um, that's important. And, and I think that takes a very close relationship with teacher prep programs. And I mean, we're the Athens of the South and we've got all these colleges around us and we should be utilizing the talent that's coming out of them. Uh, when I talk to students too, I talk about the benefit of them coming into schools, either subbing or volunteering or something, because it lets them f figure out what school they would feel best at, but also lets us, you know, it's it's a year long job interview, it's two year long, you know, and most of those people who are dedicated in that way will find that job before they graduate. So, with that in mind, Doctor, I mean, uh, Mr. Barnes, uh, your stu the student teacher supports, how can we better help? I mean, I know you all typically are used to those students being able to come into the classroom. You can recruit them face to face. Things have been changed with COVID. What supports do you need from us to be able to, to really out, you know, reach out, engage them at high level so that they do stay? I think the, the advocacy you're doing and the, and the budget priorities that you're doing help us recruit those people. So the, the, the things that you put your attention on dovetail nicely into what we talk about when we go to, t when we go to teachers. You know, you can get a, a, a signing bonus to go to another district, but you can't get the resources and support you get here. So I think that you guys are focused right in where you need to be. Okay, well, as ideas flesh out, as you need help, you know, as COVID has shifted everything, just let us know, please. And then for HBCU and HSI outreach, what does that recruitment look like? Again, because you can't go to, or you couldn't go in the fall to recruitment fairs in person. How has that impaired you all? Could you just kind of tell us the story? I want to paint the picture for the rest of the community also about how. It is, it is difficult. It is difficult to assess a, uh, an employee when you're interviewing them online. So there, oops, excuse me. There, there has been a lot of challenges. Most every career fair right now that we know of has been online. Um, so we've been working through that process the best we can. Okay, and then the, kind of in that same vein of HBCU, HSI recruitment planning, what about for male teachers? I know you said you didn't have really the desegregated data right now, but could you give, me a, give us a pulse? What is it like to recruit male teachers, and how has, ha, has it been effective throughout this pandemic? Has I, I haven't focused my attention on that specifically. Okay. Um, I know that that's something that we always look at. You find that diversity in gender becoming more equitable in high schools. Uh, than they are in elementary. That's traditionally the, the, the biggest area. They're actually not as bad in high school as they are in, in elementary. But um, I think it's, it's systemic to making sure that kids have all different sides of role models in a building. So, you know. Well, again, as you develop a need or a way that we can kind of help you all with that, just let us know. Yes, ma'am. Dr. Gentry. So I literally, in my personal, as I said earlier, my personal opinion, <laughs> me, myself, my personal opinion, um, <laughs> uh, look, I have the best job ever, right? And I'm not talking about school board. This is like the second best job ever. Um, <laughs> so I, a part of my responsibility is helping HCA healthcare build relationships with HBCUs and HSIs. So I get to do that all day long. 
And so my first question would be, do we have relationships beyond showing up at recruitment fairs? Not to this point, no. I haven't been able to develop those to the extent that I want. That's sort of our future state. Yeah, so I would say that to Ms. Pre Player Peters' comment about diversity, and if we're intentional uh, about that diversity of gender, that diversity of, of race and ethnicity, we need to start with the relationship piece. Um, and so, you know, I use this phrase at work, it's going from relationship to partnership. And so how do we, how do we form a relationship that, that starts to acclimate people to the fact that MNPS is a possibility? I'm not here to give you a job. I'm not here saying I'm going to hire you. But I, I, we, want to, we want to start making MNPS part of the vernacular in the teacher Correct. education programs at these schools. Um, you know, I will tell you that people of color tend to, tend to stay close to home if they don't have the comfort or the confidence that they know at least 60% of what they need to know <laughs> about the environment. Um, and the other thing that, that, I, that I see happening is that for those institutions that I've been able to create the relationship with, I get looped into the email, you know, bucket so that we get invited to speak on interviewing in a virtual environment. So then it looks like I really want you to be successful. So let me give you some tips. So when you come back to interview with me, Right, so again, it's more seeding that MNPS is about people, to your point, um, and we want to start that support of you, whether you choose us or not. We're here to support the, the development of quality teachers, right? So the last thing I ever talk about is giving somebody a job, but I can give you some pointers, I can give you some connections, I can give you some opportunities to improve the experience that your students are having in whatever the area that we could potentially have a partnership in. So I would, I would suggest that we, we kind, of, kind of fast forward. I know that you have nothing else to do, Dr. Bones. <laughs> and so, um, so I'm, I'm, not, you know, I'm not putting a date or timeline on this, but the, the, the quicker we can get to the relationship building with these institutions, um, the better it will be, right? So there's the history with these schools, there's the, and I know the HSI space is very fluid, right? So it's based on a threshold of the number of um, mm -hmm. Latinx students that graduate or enrolled or graduate, and that number fluctuates, but I have uh, focused on students, on schools that maintain a 50% or greater enrollment. So just kind of narrowing that down um, has been helpful for me. So I, I would just say that the sooner we can start the relationship building with the HBCUs and HS, the HBCU and HSI uh, community, the, the better. If we want to really get them hooked into MNPS. And that mirrors in my, in my last couple of districts, I worked with Fayetteville State University. Mm -hmm. and what they would do is the students would see me when they were sophomores. They'd see me again when they were mm -hmm. juniors. And they'd see me again when they were seniors. And by that time, it was, OK, now you're, you're already have a relationship. You're already coming right. to work with us. And so that's something we're building as we go forward. And, and let me just add, I just want to be um, clear about a, a couple of things and kind of bracing the board for our upcoming budget conversations um, as well. Uh, first, again, commending the board for the top priority being around employee compensation. I mean, that, that we have to address that um, sooner than later to, to retain and attract um, the quality educators and employees that we want in MMPS. And so you will see strategies um, around that space um, as we uh, present and share information to, to the board. Another area um, that is part of your board priorities is around our HR efforts. Um, and in order to get into that proactive space and being able to build those lasting relationships, we have to invest um, in this space so that we have the leadership and the individuals who can dedicate um, their time and space, and it's needed. It, it shows up in all of our data points. It shows up in the conversations we're having with our employees, including exit survey <laughs> data, um, as we're working with uh, employees that we've been able to onboard. Um, and so, you know, I think this conversation aligns directly to um, your budget priorities and the conversations we'll be having in the upcoming weeks. Folks, thank you for your support. Thanks for your advocacy. Mayor Peters and then Ms. Tyler. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. Know. I just think Dr. Balfour, because I was also thinking about employees that we do have, you know, before in the past, and I don't have the data, so excuse me, but like there's always been a cliff and then goes back to people leaving, why, there are pe why teachers are leaving, um, and how we do that, and hopefully with the uh, mayor's office committing to teachers' compensation and revamping that, that we 
we address that, that compression that usually happens in pay and stay. So I think that's very important. So I'm glad to hear as we move forward into the budget season that we're starting to address that, not only looking long term at right. the new people we recruit, but the people we do have, particularly right. in that critical, I guess, one to five years, that we maintain them so we don't have a lag in that middle, that middle age um, experience of teachers. And then also, I think also, too, we have to be mindful of we also have para pros and um, support staff that we also have to think of too when we talk about employee compensation. I know our natural defaults always talk about teachers and they're a crucial part, but also making we have teachers that are supported by the staff and that support staff are also compensated in a way that they're not doing the same struggles too, that it's a partnership between support staff and teachers. So also make sure that we just bring that to light as we talk about employees, employee compensation, and as we even recruit as those, you know, some if people who graduate from college, you may not know what you want to do right away. Or like me, you thought you were going to law school and then the LSAT had different plans for me. And then, <laughs> <laughs> then I had to do a whole term. <laughs> and I recapturing talented people like that where it's just like, oh, law school is not for me. Um, and so, so we're also being creative also in that way that if you may not be a teacher and going through the certification process, how are we gauging pair pros? How are we gauging support staff to also bring into our, our family and to have that conversation as part of compensation also. So just as we continue our conversation with data throughout the months and years forthgoing, that we keep that also in our forefront too. We had about 30. Uh, we did an office hours and, and opening for Parapros to come and talk with about our Grow Your Own programs. We had, you know, about 30 people come and just tell me more. You know, and some that's, so we grow some of our best employees that way. Yes. And make sure we also fund it. I mean, that's been issues I've had in the past where we've had some programs where to chance for support staff and to teachers, but then it's only for a handful of student, a handful of employees, and you can't upscale it into a substantial level just because you haven't had the funding. So hopefully, as we go into the budget season, we advocate with the state and with the mayor's office at the council that also we're looking at when we grow our own that we're putting substantial money that we're not just doing tens of employees, but we're doing Correct. hundreds of employees that we em we employ ten thousand employees, tens of employees is not putting a dent. And we're investing about growing our own also. One of the best teachers I had in my last district was a cafeteria manager. And one of our best new teachers, he came over from a totally different area, was great. So anybody who's interested who's listening as well, you know, please contact us. We've seen an increase in some, oh, no, go ahead. Ms. Go ahead, go ahead. Mm -mm. <laughs> I was just going to ask a little bit about, um, principles, you have a slide about effective principles, and I think anybody who's ever been in a, in a school understands how important the principle is to set the tone for the entire school. And I have seen, I have worked in schools where there's been a change of leadership, and you can, I mean, just almost immediately from year to year, you can sense a, a difference in the morale of the staff and, and the want to stay there or um, the, the loyalty towards the group that you're working with. Um, so I know that you guys have done a couple new things as far as allow, allowing the principals to have um, time specifically to share ideas with one another about what's working and what isn't working. And we spend a lot of time talking about teacher um, development, professional development. And I just wanted to ask a little bit about principal professional development. Yes, um, do I see Mason? There he is. Um, Mason Bellamy, our um, chief of academics and schools, he leads a lot of, his team leads um, all um, of our um, principal professional development and learning. So Mason, you might want to share a little insight around some of y'all's current work. Absolutely. So we actually had a division of schools retreat today to do just that and plan our landing and our launch that has been traditionally used here in MMPS to really um, you know, the landing to solidify the end of the year and what needs to happen during the summer in planning and then the launch to get ready for next year. But um, in our partnership work that Chris mentioned with NPEF, the framework that you saw, um, there'll be a great deal of um, training rolled out through that signature initiative, both at the school level. So Chris referred to that it's leadership for everywhere, wherever, wherever you sit in the organization. But specifically, we'll be using that particular framework to leverage those behaviors that we all see in our most effective and the principles that you worked with that you remember fondly. Um, and to replicate that, my executive directors will be um, creating intentional time with them to work in networks to do the sharing that you're talking about. Um, our PLN meetings that have happened, that happen monthly, 
Um, we have, I won't say the word overhaul because our agenda has been very refined over the years. Even when I came in, there were very specific parts of it and voice and choice sessions where they got to opt to what they wanted to go get their professional development for. But they have told us loud and clear that they want more time with one another within their network to share. And so the last two or three agendas for the PLN going back to December, you've seen dedicated time where the networks have done just that with topics related to our focused outcomes, whether they were the attendance measures you saw Dr. Springer report on last week and those numbers going in the positive direction, whether it was MAP percentages and just as simple as trying to get our percent of students successfully testing in MAP from in the mo low 70s where we were in the fall to the low 90s where we were this time. Um, so that was a December topic. And so monthly we're creating time for them to commit to that, to share with one another best practices, um, and then we're using this spring to springboard into next year through a variety of our signature initiatives. But um, they will get lots of opportunities for exactly what you just described in the um, in the months ahead as we close out the year and then all summer long. Yeah, and I'll, I'll bring our attention back to core tenant number one, uh, which is us re-envisioning the way um, our central office supports we're transforming into a support hub, and we're serious um, about this work. And so uh, we're transforming, being responsive to the needs of our principals, our teachers, our staff members. And so as Mason mentioned, we're continuing to adapt agendas, when those planning times happen, um, opportunities to share best practices. Um, so this is a real thing, including uh, one thing that Dr. Barnes didn't get to hit on uh, with our exit survey. We've heard lots of feedback around that being an email generated um, survey, and a lot of times your email was cut off before you had an opportunity to complete the exit <laughs> survey, um, and so he's now created a website um, where employees can go in and fill their data out, not to rely on just the email um, system, and he always expresses his doors open. We want to try to avoid any of those conversations prior to um, any of our employees making a decision to exit that is within our control as opposed to out of our control. So uh, we're really serious about re-envisioning Central Office um, as a support hub. That includes thinking about how we support our principals um, and their professional learning and building their capacity as well. Um, and then I know for teachers, it's really important those first five years. I know you touched on that, Dr. Barnes, about making sure that our teachers have that support right off the bat. Do you see that that's something that the principals also need when they first switch from maybe assistant principal to a principal? Is that, do you have a mentorship program that, that works with them? Anything to help support them, maybe more than a typical principal who's really a veteran and knows what they're doing? So again, as, as part of our work with MPEF, that'll be part of the, the model is layering supports based on the need of the principal, right? And part of that is making sure that our newly appointed principals, one, have had the experiences they need in the assistant principal role, the right role models there, but also that they're fit for the school. And rather than saying this happens to be the school that's open, so we're going to put you there, um, really taking a model where you're building a bench of folks that are selected for the school based on the school's need and based on that candidate's perceived uh, or not perceived strengths, but actual measured strengths, right? So rather than saying, here's the person who's next in line for whatever job comes up, it's here's this candidate, the qualities that they've exhibited, the leadership um, that they've exhibited, and then here are the school's needs and, and making those matches appropriately. And then, of course, once they're there, the uh, professional development I'll continue to pursue for my division of schools, my executive directors as the principal leaders is just that. So how do you coach your principals a little bit differently depending on their need? We want to select, um, connect them to, cut to principals that already exist as a support, just like you would as a teacher, right? Your teacher across the hall from you probably did for you what mine did for me. Carol Beavers, if you're listening, shout out to uh, helping me survive my first year in the classroom. Um, but we've also got principals that do that as well. And so um, I can't even name them all, but if they're out there listening tonight, Beth Unfried and Emily Vaughn, shout out to helping me survive my first year in the principalship. <laughs> so we're going to connect principals that way. And then, of course, their ED is going to spend a little bit more time with them, additional school visits. Um, and in, in a kind of a tiered-based system, just like we would our students, right? So. Yeah, and we'll, we'll need to continue to protect and expand our ED networking model. Um, that is a strength to our structure um, here in the district, pairing our principals based upon their tier and location in the district to one um, coach or supervisor. Um, so we do want to continue those efforts, and we're currently piloting right now um, a group of um, principal mentors as success coaches um, to go in and th be thought partners side by side um, with principals, principals, particularly during this time as, as we're navigating the pandemic, but we see it as a promising strategy as we're moving forward. Thank you. Dr. Gentry? Just curious, uh, between, <clears throat> oh, he left, he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> 
And I don't know if either one of you may be able to answer. Do we ever, uh, do we do um, multi-level professional development together where there's principals, teachers, others co-mingled in the room together? So it, or is it usually just focused on principals, teachers? A lot of times it will be differentiated. Um, our MTSS meetings, for example, we will, uh, schools will bring their entire teams, which will have teachers, it'll have interventionists, it'll have principals. Our PLN meetings are principal specific. When we have AP and Dean meetings, we're oftentimes deans of instruction, to, uh, deans of um, the, the various different dean roles will come with the assistant principal. Um, and we definitely tr uh, put our principals in networks as well, where you'll have elementary, middle, and high principals together. But the opportunities to bring teachers and principals at the same time are often difficult to do, obviously, during the year, right? Because you, you need the amount of subs you need to, to pull uh, teachers out of the classroom to do that makes it difficult. Um, however, I think with, uh, for example, lots of, lots of information that will be coming out about our literacy implementation soon, you'll see training guides that are meant just for that. And that school best practices will be that a school comes together with their entire mm -hmm. leadership team, which will be made up of teachers, um, special, uh, special area teachers included, where their role fits in, um, librarians or media, um, media specialists, as well as the instructional leaders. So we definitely want to empower our schools to use their leadership team and PLC models for that. It can certainly be difficult to do during the school year, though. So the best time we're going to have to do that is going to be um, during the summer to get bigger groups, and then during the school year, focus groups like your MTSS meetings or a content area where in a high school, if I'm the science lead for admin, I might go with my science teachers. There's certainly opportunities there, and that's a best practice that we would, we would seek to support our schools in as much as we can. It, it definitely depends on the content, but we hear loud and clear from principals, APs, and deans that they want their own protected time a lot of the times so they can be vulnerable and, you know, ask the questions that they really do need to ask. But there definitely is a point in time where we have to have um, a mixed grouping of leaders from schools to come together, hear the same information at the same time to implement with fidelity. Yeah. We'll talk offline because right. I have different thunk, just questions. Sure. Okay. Other questions? Ms. Bush? Um, yeah, I just have a question. Um, so we have teachers. The biggest concerns that I hear from teachers is being able to move up, being able to, um, you know, we have teachers that go and get their doctorates, and um, they're wanting to stay within MMPS, but they feel like they're not able to move up. Um, is there any type of training for these um, these individuals? Because that's those are some of the concerns I'm hearing. And so they feel like they stay stuck and that they cannot move up. And they reach out to HR to, feel, to, to get that guidance on what they can do in order to be considered in higher positions. So how does that work for those teachers? I mean, for those, yeah, those individuals. I'll let uh, Dr. Barnes speak from the HR perspective. From uh, the instruction perspective, again, I'll go back to our model from MPEF that we're uh, getting close to finalizing and being able to push the work out that will really delineate pathways for any employee in the district from where they currently are to where they envision themselves being. Um, it is a competency-based program, though. So rather than saying these are boxes I check, I go get this degree or I take this course and I'm going to get the next job, it's really more competency-based in the sense that I take these opportunities, I demonstrate my competencies in these areas, and then we match to the fits that, that might be coming up afterwards. But ultimately, we would want every teacher, um, coach, um, or anybody that may be in a... Um, you know, an assistant role right now to see that pathway for them, that here are my opportunities, these are the supports I can get to pursue those things, and then this is how the process works. We want to be as transparent as possible in the Division of Schools as to how that process works and how you could pursue that. And then I'll let Chris, chime, I believe, the rest of it to HR. I think some of it is a series of, of supply and demand. You know, sometimes there are a few positions and there are a lot of applicants. I always encourage people who do come to me to look for ways to lead within their own building and look for things, um, you know, traditionally assistant principal come and say, hey, I want to be principal, what do I need to do? And I'll encourage them to find something in their building that they can have complete ownership of from beginning to end that shows its data and shows what they've done. And, and usually there's more success when they can speak to something that they've owned and, and led one way or the other and have actionable data coming out of that. And that's what that leadership framework speaks directly to. I, I will add that we do have... Um, <laughs> Aspiring Administrators Academy that will be kicking off again soon this spring. Um, that's application-based, and the cohort goes through, and again, competency-based to demonstrate the competencies they're learning through the program. Um, and uh, part of our, our leadership model is also putting the burden on building leaders and empowering those that work for you. 
And if you look at the team administrator rubric that my executive directors use to um, evaluate principals, to go from a three to five in almost every category specifically says builds capacities in others and then list the different behaviors. And so your principals really do have the burden of leadership and that they should be building their assistant principals and their leadership team and their teachers that way. And so our, our framework is gonna be designed or is designed to give attention in those areas so that as a principal, you, you can't do everything yourself and you'll certainly drive yourself crazy trying. So you have to empower others and build capacity. Um, and our framework will, will demonstrate our commitment to that um, in the future. What was the name of the program? This summer, you said you were rolling out something. Firing Administrators this Academy, summer. I believe. I, I could be confusing that with a different acronym, but I'll, I'll get it for you specifically. Okay. But it's essentially for folks that are currently um, in the classroom that want to aspire to be an administrator and then assistant principals that want to aspire to be principals. Thank you. Dr. Jim, go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, Dr. Battle is a great example of someone who's, who came up, you know, from the beginning to where she is now. I'm a great example of someone who lateraled in halfway through. Um, so there's, there's benefit on, from both tracks. I think obviously there is compensation differences as people go up in degrees, um, but we encourage those people to keep trying because sometimes there are a limited number of options for, for, for those opportunities you know, within the central office or in other places. All right, Dr. Gentry? Yeah, so this is one of those examples where multi-tier professional development comes in handy. And so you and I have had this conversation, Dr. Battle, this particular book of work I was sharing uh, with Dr. Battle that I'm engaged in in another space, not necessarily relevant here, but we encourage multi-level engagement in that, in that training course. So it's not about math, it's not about science, it's about leadership. It's a leadership development course, not leadership in literacy, <laughs> leadership, and math. It's about the individual. And so one of the things that we do in that course is it allows um, someone who may be a manager or director to sit in a room with a VP and hear the kinds of decisions that VP has to make and hear the inputs that go into that decision and understand. And we call it creating intelligent followership, right? So now you understand why things happen the way they happen. And I will tell you, as a hiring manager, as a manager of people, that is probably the most difficult conversation to have, is the one that Ms. Bush has, has teed up, right? When am I gonna get promoted? When am I gonna get to the next level? And there's so many things that go into that, right? And so even when we say things like, we're gonna give it that name, what'd you call it? Aspiring? That's the one, that's it, that's it. It's what's called now, is in the minutes. <laughs> the Aspiring Administrators Academy, AAA. Look at that. Want to stay away You're so from handy. <laughs> so the AAA, right? Even with that. So in, in my organization, we have an, an executive development program. And the desire is to prepare you for the next level, not to ensure that you get the job, because you still got to interview. And there's 52 other people <laughs> interviewing for that same position. So it's challenging. It's a difficult conversation. I mean, I just don't know how to, you know, is there a way to kind of map out that pipeline, right, or what those interventions are, the, the triple A's, you know, what do you do? How do you prepare yourself to be considered, not to prepare yourself to be guaranteed a position, right? And so, again, hard conversation to have. Most people, they just get, it's frustrating. It's frustrating when you've been in a role 10, 15, 20 years, and you, 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 you see others, and we always think that we would have been better, <laughs> right? We would have been a better choice for that position. So maybe, I, I was just curious, is there some place that someone can go to say, to see, what does that pipeline, what does that path look like? What are the interventions? That, what are that's the what our work with MPEF will outline. Okay. Um, and it may be um, a, a committee meeting along the way, or it may be a presentation at a board meeting uh, at once that work is finalized. But that is almost exactly what that, that building the bench and that pipeline will do. Um, it'll outline expectations for every role you're in. If you're a principal, this is your duty to groom the people that, that seek those jobs under you. This is the support you have for doing that. This is my role as a district administrator. Chris's role as an HR. Um, and so it will outline all of those things and, and do exactly that so that anybody in the organization that wants to move ahead can have a, a place to start and say, these, these are my next moves and this is what I see for myself and these are the supports that are available to me to do that. And remember that every individual has their own strengths and weaknesses and schools have different needs and different wants. And so sometimes that means you need to tailor the need of the school with the strengths of the individual. And, and that may not be a, a situation of how long they've been in the district. It may be just the way your skill set. 
Hey, this is a great conversation. This is exactly what the leadership framework is all about. We want to be clear about the skills, the competencies we want in our leaders, and knowing what it takes to be an effective um, leader, no matter which seat um, our employees are sitting in, but also articulating those pathways um, towards success. And just like our students, for our staff, those pathways may look a little bit different based upon the strengths and the aspirations um, of the employee. And you know, one example um, personally that I had just moving um, through our district. One of my, my greatest success has been student achievement and growth. But my next one is being able to prepare many executive principals that are serving their schools well right now. And one specific example with our student-based budgeting process, that's not something that other school team members get to see the entire budget because of all the privacy that's in there with employees I and mean, everything. But I remember with one of my academy principals many years ago, um, I brought her along because I knew she was aspiring to be a principal. She sat with me during the budget process. She went with me to my presentation of my budget to um, the central office support team. and. Just a couple weeks later, <laughs> she was appointed an executive principalship. We didn't know that that was coming right then, but goodness, that was a great experience for her to hear my thinking and to know what that process looks like. And we want to start that early, and we want to have those kinds of supports often for those who aspire to be um, in these leadership roles. And there's so many complexities, so many roles, you almost can't even cover them all. Most administrators will tell you that they never thought they knew enough the first time <laughs> they walked into it because there's so many different moving pieces. But back to the other point about pipelines, we've had lots of conversations about the term pipeline. And get into your point, Dr. Gentry, that what we're trying to what we're trying to communicate there is not just wait your turn. Eventually, if you stay long enough, you'll get there. But the understanding that as you're developing your skills, we're going to be matching your skill sets to places where you can be successful, and that is something we should be um, very cognizant about. We want to set our employees up for success when they move into these leadership roles. And sometimes, um, if we do, if we're not intentional about that, we're we're getting our employees in spaces and situations where um, they're they're just not going to be successful. We're, they're already starting behind um, the A-ball, if you will, in, in getting done or accomplishing what they need to. So we're taking very seriously that as we're shifting and appointing and supporting our employees in these leadership roles, that we're connecting their skill sets, their needs to the needs of the community or the department that they're serving. Leadership is not position dependent, that, it, that it's embedded in all the work that everyone yep. does. This is Player Peters. Yeah, I just want to that's also just taking it a step further that since you, it's also a numbers game, you know, there's so many principals, so many, but also if they have to leave the district, they're also a promoter of the district where then you're also recruiting as they move leadership roles that they come to us as teaching because then you show there's a leadership path and we're also a place to incubator too. So hopefully when we do that nurturing, that it also use that as cheerleaders to recruit newer teachers to come back to the district if they have to leave the district to get those leadership opportunities, just because the sheer numbers that you're going to have to in, to engage in. So, um, yeah, I'm excited to hear all of this. And the better we get at this vacancy thing, the more tension that that will create. Yeah. yeah. Because sometimes a good principal pushes you to become a good school board member. So, you know, <laughs> I'm looking at you, Dr. Springer. <laughs> Appreciate you. Uh, I do have one question about substitutes. Have we really seen an increase in substitutes? Uh, yes, actually, I, I wrote down every question I thought you guys might ask to me. And <laughs> <laughs> Not a challenge, don't worry. No. Um, this week, we actually have 17 applicants who've been cleared. Uh, they're coming to this Thursday's orientation. We have onboarded 111 substitute employees this school year, and we now are up to 829 substitute employees on our active roster. Wonderful. Just, again, the community supporting us, I just appreciate it. It's been a rocky road, but I'm glad we're continuing to forge ahead. So thank you for this. Any other thoughts or questions? All right, we'll move on. Uh, we just have thank one you. report. Yes, thank you for all of this. Thank you, everyone involved, all of you. But um, we have one report from uh, our governance committee. That's been the only committee to meet recently. If you do have a committee that you would like, if you have a, a committee meeting you would like to put on the agenda, please make sure you're looping in Dr. Severe, Cameo, and myself so we can get those scheduled. We can talk through what the expectations are for those meetings. All right, Mrs. Pupa Walker. So for those of you that don't know, the school board is, con is um, 
kind of halfway through a book study on the book Essential, the Essential School Board book. And so we spent some time tonight talking about chapter three, uh, which is really around how do we become much more focused on student achievement embedding data and structuring meetings and, and retreats and so forth around um, data and achievement and really centering student progress. Um, and so one of the, I thought the best takeaways maybe so far out of this was the sort of collective decision to maybe do some data literacy training so we can hear and learn the same language school personnel are using to talk about student progress and um, benchmarking and on a whole host of, of things. So that was really, really promising. And then the other thing I'll just say as an aside is we talked um, at the retreat, now I can't remember, maybe it was here, about a student school board member that is moving forward. We're gonna have a meeting next week. Anybody on this board is invited to come. It's virtual and I will send you ahead of time sort of a packet of information. And so really it's meant to be, a, let's go through and make some decisions, A or B, C or D start date, profile, selection, all those good things. Get the wheels rolling, lots of interest in the community about this. And so I know our high school students will, I'm afraid actually about how many applications we're gonna get. Mm -hmm. And so um, very excited to see a student sitting up here with us next year, next school year. And, um, and so stay tuned on that. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, we'll slide right into announcements. Mrs. Tyler, would you mind beginning? Um, well, first of all, I just want to go back again and circle back around to what I said earlier. I contact your state senator, ask them to support that bill, SB 1358, the one-time hazard bonus pay for school district employees. It's SB 1358. And again, on the advocacy side, um, our council will be voting on the capital needs budget uh, for MMPS during their March 2nd meeting. And first, I wanna thank the mayor for the largest investment in our school infrastructure um, in my history. And I'm really excited about the new high school coming out to my district especially, um, but knowing that we're gonna have the money for maintenance and HVAC repairs and the things that we need to do to keep our schools safe is exciting. Um, so I wanna encourage everybody to advocate to your city council member and all five at-large members to approve the mayor's capital needs budget for MNPS. Thank you, Mrs. Tyler. Mrs. Masters. Ditto, ditto. <laughs> no, I, did. I wanted to just take a moment because it, it, we were watching the whole director's report and we did not stop and uh, show a whole lot of expressive excitement for our teachers, principal, and support staff of the year. And on the night that we did the proclamation about the arts, Dr. Gregory Stewart, the executive principal of the Nashville School of the Arts. As you will know, that's how you say it if you have a child that goes to school there, because that's how he says it on his call-outs, is principal of the year. And Jeremy Lee, one of the support staff. Along, Anyway, I just feel like we should stand up and clap for everyone that got that on. Okay, thank you, I feel better now. Um, <laughs> and then I also want to um, mention that the good work of Pencil is ongoing. They're such an amazing partner um, to Metro National Public Schools. They are hot on the trail of a space where they could open a satellite LP pencil box in Southeast Nashville. Um, they're in look of a, a space that can be generously donated by some benefactor who would like to do that for us so that we can have that space there. Um, so just putting that call out to the community as well. Um, I think that's all. Oh, and I also wanted to mention that we had a lovely meeting on February 18th about the new Goodlettsville Elementary School that's being built and the fact that they will be housed in the what the former Graymar building um, for two years while that construction is taking place. Um, we had really good turnout at that meeting. Um, I learned that I used to teach dance to the architect's um, stepdaughter, so that was exciting. Nashville continues to be a small town. And, um, and so just a lot of excitement in the community around what's going on with that school. And then the um, Parent Advisory Council meeting was postponed because of snow. 
And so that will take place on March 2nd. And what that means is if parents are still interested in serving in that capacity, speak to your school principal um, and elections will be held on March 2nd for that group. That's all I got. Great, right, thank you, Ms. Masters. Mrs. Player Peters. Um, yes, Edo, thank you the mayor for, for the capital um, improvement budget and investing in our schools, um, particularly with deferred maintenance also, so I just wanna echo that. And then um, also echo what Ms. Masters said about, um, it's about to, the employees of the year, particularly support staff. I know in the past they have felt um, excluded um, not being recognized for being employees of the year. So the fact that we're doing that and we're recognizing them, and particularly by, depart, by uh, department, um, just thank Dr. Battle and her staff for recognizing support staff that they're also included as employees and as part of the family. Um, also, um, there will be a budget meeting March 9th at 3.30. So we'll begin our budget process on March 9th. So let's put that on everyone's radar. You'll get more information about how we're gonna go through um, the meeting and committee process, but that will be our first kind of full uh, discussion on the operating budget for fiscal year 21-22. So I wanna put that on everybody's radar that's coming up in the next couple of weeks. And then last, um, not least, I just wanna us just take a moment just to recognize that yesterday, half a million people have passed away because of COVID. Um, this pandemic has not been easy on any of us, particularly as we um, navigate something that we as a country has never navigated before, and particularly us as a school district. Oh, Dr. Battle and her team, I know it's been a difficult process for students, for teachers, for parents, just exercising our ways and our lives through a pandemic and trying to change, to abruptly change how we learn going into a different environment, how we learn and continue learning and having discussions that has been very unprecedented and uncharted time. So just um, out of this half a million uh, people that passed away, 200 were, were children. I think that's also got, gets caught up in, um, in the discussion. So this condolences, I know I've been personally affected by acquaintances that have passed away. I had friend, uh, friends whose parents passed away. Um, and so I know we've all been touched by a death. And so just marking that moment of where we are and the fact that almost a year later from the pandemic, we are finally getting phasing in getting back to a new normal, whatever that looks like. And hopefully we can surpass it with the vaccines and all the progress we made in science. But just one as a board and just personally to thank Dr. Battle, just I know it hasn't been difficult, particularly <laughs> this is your first year. You have not reached your one year anniversary yet. And it has been difficult. And we had half the board turn over in the midst of this. So it was a lot for new leaders coming on and governing in this time. And so we just did that be rest just to mark the moment of where we are and that a year later that hopefully by next year, we have a normal school year. We're in a normal setting. Everyone's vaccinated. So as we go on through the process that we just continue just to be thoughtful and mindful as, um, as is where we've been through. So that's all I have. Thank you, Mrs. Player Peters. Mr. Little. Um, yes, um, wanted to announce the pre-K application process opens up on March 1st. Um, I know a lot of parents in my district have been um, ready for that. The optional schools, um, the selections are happening on March 8th. Wanted to thank the, the Elevate Leadership in, in District 4 for inviting me to speak, but also allowing Dr. Battle to present. Um, it seemed like there was a lot of excitement. Also, the Hermitage Rotary got a chance to circle around there and introduce myself. Thank you to the executive principal, Ms. Covey of McGavey Elementary. Um, we had a really um, awesome conversation as we talked about just academics and just community-driven projects. Um, and then thank you to the elementary um, school teacher of the year, Ms. Crystal Hicks. Um, she invited me, her and the staff at Robert Church Wills for um, Read Me Week. So I was looking, I was like, oh, I was like, that's Ms. Hicks. So th <laughs> um, thank you to those guys, pretty excited about that. And just two things, what I'm hearing from the community, um, you guys probably have heard, but some parents wanted to make those one-time decisions in reference to in-person and virtual. Um, I know, you know, some things are just set in stone. And then Stanford Montessori in the fifth grade realignment, those are just um, messages and phone calls that I've gotten myself. Thank you, Mr. Little. Ms. Bush? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, we have congratulated our teachers, our principals, our students, we're so excited about them being phased back in. Um, and tonight, uh, I want to recognize one of our very own. Uh, she's one of ours. Uh, this is Black History Month. 
And I want to congratulate Miss Cameo Bobo. Miss mm-hmm. Cameo Bobo for not only pursuing her dreams and her skills and her brains. Cameo has done three things within one year that she's accomplished. She's accomplished, and, and here it is. Mm-hmm. Look at there. Yes, yeah, she did. She wrote her own book. She just launched it, or she did her... Um, soft launch. Yes, her soft launch. And she also have her own single out called 2020 is my year. 2020, huh? 21. 21 yeah. now, right? <laughs> <laughs> now, right? And she also has her own clothing line that I am so proud to wear on weekends because I like to sport. I don't even wear, like, <laughs> hoodies and stuff like that. But I look good in your stuff, girl. <laughs> so I just want to tell you congratulations to Miss Cameo Bobo for her accomplishment. And if we can stand up and give her a round of applause. Let's send them, guys. We're all here, right? Mm-hmm. Let's her. All right. Love you, Cam. All right, uh, I'll start with uh, uh, some announcements for dish. Dang, what's up? <laughs> It's like I, I, don't, I got you guys. I did. I got excited at 6, 6.40. Okay, go right ahead. No. I'm, I'm sorry about that, Mrs. Pupo. Okay. All right. All right. Just um, right I also want to just... Um, Slowly. I also... Yeah, really. <laughs> I just want to take a few minutes tonight. I'm just kidding. Um, really excited for fifth and ninth graders to come back. And, and, and I want to say that there are lots of things we'll learn through this pandemic. And some things will be different forever and for the better. And you have to wonder if it's not a great idea to bring fifth and ninth back a little bit earlier before everybody else and make that a tradition and allow them to come in and build community. And I I just think that is an important thing. And I want to just thank Dr. Battle for her thoughtful approach to this entire entry, re-entry, closing, coming back, snow, all of the things, and keeping keeping all of this moving forward in such a calm sense. I'm just very grateful for that. Congrats to Janelle Gansky, who's a Hillsboro um, High School Teacher of the Year, uh, voice teacher. Um, I want to thank Julia Green for inviting me to be part of their accreditation process. So I got to be part of the team that spoke to the accreditation committee or whatever the group that does the accreditation to just talk about the good work at Julia Green. I was excited about that. Um, I want to encourage everybody to participate in Read Me Week. So I've been invited to read at Waverly Belmont next week virtually, and so excited about that. And then the other person I want to thank tonight is Ashford Hughes, who has fielded requests. This is the hardest time of the year for people in that spot, this school choice mm-hmm. option time. Lots of questions. And anyway totally graceful under pressure and always responsive and appreciate all you do every day, Ashford Hughes. Thank you. Yep. Great. All right, okay. Dr. Gentry. So Crystal Hicks, Robert Churchwell, District 1, Teacher of the Year, congratulations. Um, as has already been shared, Read Me Week, it's already been shared, but please, if you have not signed up for one of your schools to read virtually, um, it's probably harder to get people to sign up now than it has been when you were able to be there in person. Um, so please reach out to a school uh, if you haven't. And then, uh, Ms. Bugs, are you going to talk about the book Brothers? I am, but you can Okay, no, you got it. And then I just want to share that uh, I know we've been talking about the property utilization conversation. Uh, we were going to do it at, uh, last week, and then so we're going to bump it. Um, we want to do it today, so we're going to bump it for two, two weeks from, so the next board meeting prior to, so I don't know if it'll be three or four o'clock, depends on what else goes on, but prior to the board meeting, the next board meeting, we'll convene around the property utilization, because I think a couple of us have some properties that need to be discussed. Now it's my turn. So sorry about that. Didn't mean to cut you all off. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's sliding. I'll start with uh, District 4. Um, Rachel Ann Elrod, she and I you know, decided early on that we really wanted to have conversations with the council, and she's been spearheading a lot of these conversations with councilmen, or, uh, the Education Committee Chair of the Council, uh, Council Member Tom Druffel, and the Vice Chair, Council Lady Erin Evans. We were scheduled to have a meeting this past week, but of course, with the, because of the snow, we decided to... Uh, Push it to next Thursday, March 4th. 
you all will be getting the invitation because it's coming from the council. So the council staff will be sending that to us. If, we, if any other MNPS staff want to want to be there as um, a participant instead of an attendee, please just let us know. We'll make sure that you all get, you know, I guess this is more to you, Dr. Battle. If you know anyone that needs to be, we'll be sure that everyone gets the invitation uh, to participate. So thank you to uh, Mrs. Elroy for that. Uh, I'm a member of the National Shakespeare Festival Board, and the Tennessee Department, yeah, the Tennessee Day on the Hill is March 10th. So this was a perfect time for us to be talking, or for us to be proclaiming our support of arts education, because it's a big, fo a big focus of the Shakespeare Festival. So it's virtual. If anyone wants to log on, please do. It's happening on that date from 10 to 1. Um, Again, I want to highlight that this was the first year for support staff of the year. You know, we do appreciate all of our staff, but I think we've done a good job the last few years of making sure that everyone that's in a building with it, or anyone that is a staff member of MNPS, that they know that they are an educator. We do sometimes lump them in that teacher, under that teacher category, but because they are teachers. So just thank you to all staff members, but a special shout out to the, excuse me, to those who have won uh, staff of the year recognition. Um, thank you again to Dr. Battle. You've not only continued to make thoughtful decisions, but being able to manage conversations and relationships in the community. You did a phenomenal job this past weekend with Vice Mayor Shulman. Just was really, really proud, really thoughtful uh, questions and answers. So just thank you for your continuing to, to be graceful under pressure. Um, I'm really, really excited. I always talk about the way that the community has really wrapped their, their hands around MNPS and around our babies. Books Brothers, if you have not heard about it, I promise you will. It is um, a consortium of different organizations around the city, including but not limited to the National Public Library, um, United Way of Greater Nashville, My Brother's Keeper, the Nashville chapter, which is spearheaded by Mr. Lionel Matthews, our juvenile court clerk, and Ashford Hughes, our director of Diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's, it's a long. Diver diversity, equity, and inclusion, and the school choice office. I just know you have a lot of stuff. so. Um, <laughs> So just think, uh, it's men of color reading books, you know, and Ingram has partnered with, the, with us to be, able to, to be able to give these books to free to just men of color in the community, have them be recorded reading their books. And then this is just another way of, this is another opportunity for volunteerism. So if you know someone who wants to be a bro books brother, we're gonna start extending that offer to our high school students. Uh, you know, we've, we've spoken with Mr. Amato at Maplewood to see how we can work with Project Lit to make sure those young people are able to, to read books to their elementary school peers. So just if you know anyone, please send them my way, send them our way, or send them to the blueprintnashville.org website, or just Google Books Brothers, and you can sign up. So just thank you to those men. You'll be seeing those on YouTube. You'll be seeing them a, a little bit of everywhere once this fully launched. Um, I also want to highlight in that same vein, Bookham and 50 Forward have a similar program where they have uh, volunteers reading books. So if you are just someone in the community that wants to, please look, please reach out to either Bookham or 50 Forward. Um, Oh, I do have to say this. Uh, a couple of my neighbors and I are trying to commit to sending our kids to our zone school. We are looking at uh, supporting Jones that merger between Buena Vista and Jones with a bit more fidelity from the community. You know, my community is uh, gentrifying, and so we've had a lot of opting out. So we have a lot of people who opt out of schools and then wonder why their neighborhood schools are not really thriving. And so if you're someone that lives in that 37203, 37208 zip code, and you'd like to talk to me about this, this is just, this is kind of as a separate, as a parent, I'm looking to enroll my child, and I have a couple of neighbors who are willing to do, do the same so that we can show the world that zone schools are phenomenal. We just have to make sure we support them. Lastly, oh my gosh, and I wasn't going to cry, but the reason that I brought that up is Warner Arts Magnet. Mm -hmm. If you heard the story of Warner, if you listen to the podcast, The Promise, if you listen to the podcast, Nice White Parents, then you look at Warner Arts Magnet and you want them to continue to thrive because they are doing such great work. <sighs> They didn't get a chance last year. They were on the priority list, but they were about to roll right off as soon as Tea and Ready came and then the pandemic changed everything. But they are being recognized as a beacon school for Blue Ribbon Schools of Excellence. This is by that National Blue Ribbon Academy, that nonprofit organization that deems schools worthy of you to, uh, to, to receive this honor. And I just, I could not, I, I know Dr. Gibbs, he wants to prop up all of his staff, but I could not help but to thank him, his staff, the MSAP team, which has been incredibly impactful and powerful and turning our, our schools around and making sure that the community is supporting them. Just, I know we've been clapping a lot, but Warner Arts Magnet, I mean, they, they, were, they were a priority school. They were one that its reputation is just now beginning to catch up to what the good work that's been happening. Please give them a round of applause where they sing your hearts are out loud. 
It's the power of zone schools and offering resources is just so, so powerful. So on that note, thank you all for staying with us. It's 648, you have a good night. Be the no for the business, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>